Hey everybody, it's Lon Seibin, and I just got back from New York City where I went to another one of these Pepcom shows. What I like about these shows is that they get a lot of consumer electronics companies in one room and you can very quickly go around and see a whole bunch of cool stuff. Now their big show is in Vegas for CES. Uh, these smaller shows happen throughout the year and they actually had a lot of cool stuff to take a look at. So I'm going to show you some of the notable things that I saw on the trip last night. So let's start off with Lenovo. They have a couple of new low-cost laptops. The first one we've got here is the Flex 14. This is a low-cost yoga device that actually just showed up in my mailbox when I got back. It's going to be under $1,000 and kind of the entry point to that design that they have across a whole bunch of different configurations in their product line. So we'll have a closer look at that later this week, hopefully. And then there was another device there that really intrigued me called the ThinkBook, not to be confused with a ThinkPad. And this is a low cost uh, laptop essentially that starts under $600 for its 13 inch configuration. It's gonna have i5 and i7 processors available, 1080p display. The 14 inch model, which you see on screen right here, will have an AMD GPU built in. It's a 540X. And I'm really eager to get my hands on one of these to see exactly what it can do. And especially if it's all under $1,000, I think it might be an attractive option for people going back to school. And they also told me that it's an option for companies that are building out their fleet of laptops to keep costs under control. You can get a ThinkBook versus a ThinkPad. And I think that's the angle they're going with there. But we'll hopefully get one in and do a full review on it soon. And we also got a look at the Wallabot, which is a stud finder that gives you some idea as to what is in the wall. Uh, so what they've got here is the ability to differentiate between metal and wooden studs. And in addition to that, it will also locate wires or pipes in the wall. It can't differentiate, though, a wire from a pipe, but it represents them as the same thinner uh, line on the screen as you're running it back and forth. So you can kind of get an idea as to what you are about to drill into. Uh, they say this version of the Wallabot works with plaster as well. So it gives you a little bit more than a standard stud finder would, but of course you'll pay a little bit more too. It costs $89 and it only works with Android smartphones at the moment. And it's interesting because most of the time these devices start on the iPhone and then work their way over to Android. In this case, the Android owners get first dibs on it. And speaking of Android phones, we saw a couple of different options from two companies that were affordable, relatively speaking. Uh, the first is from Motorola. They had their new Moto Z4 on display. This came out just a little while ago. It has a Snapdragon 675 processor with Android 9 built in. It's got an OLED display 1080 by 2340. It's got an integrated fingerprint reader in the screen like we're starting to see on some other higher end smartphones. I thought that was pretty cool. It's got a 48 megapixel camera on the back and a 25 megapixel camera on the front and it costs $499 and it's unlocked and works across every carrier here in the US. It's pretty reasonable I think for what it is. Uh, not the fastest processor, but we saw with that uh, Google Pixel 3a, you don't always need the fastest processor to have a good mobile experience, and this phone looks rather interesting. Now, it also supports those Moto mods, and we looked at a bunch of those a couple of years ago. Uh, they've added a new one that supports 5G networks, so if you're fortunate enough to live in an area where there is 5G, it's very limited right now, you can attach this to the back of your phone and get a data boost, but of course it will add some girth to your phone in the process. Uh, they told me that that 5G adapter will actually work uh, backwards as well, and it should actually be working on phones from the Moto Z2 era on up. So it looks like you'll be able to get 5G with a slightly older phone too. Now, I was also surprised to see Nokia at the show, uh, but this is not the Nokia you remember. So if you recall, Nokia was one of the biggest phone manufacturers in the world. They were based out of Finland. Microsoft acquired them and started having them make Windows phones. Now, those Windows phones were very well received, but they didn't sell very well, and Microsoft kind of gave up on the effort. And a bunch of executives in Finland at Nokia left the company and formed a new one called HMD. They then acquired the rights to the Nokia name and are now manufacturing phones that look like Nokia phones and have the brand name on them, and they're designing them in Finland just like they used to. Uh, but they are now targeting the budget sector of the market, and all of these phones are running Android. They do have one high-end phone, but the rest of them are going to fall into that budget category. The one that I found most intriguing was the Nokia 4.2. This is a low-cost phone, $189. It's got dual cameras on the back. 
It'll work on T-Mobile and AT&T here in the U.S. Snapdragon 439 processor and a 720p display. Nothing spectacular, but an attractive phone that doesn't cost all that much. I'm going to try to get one in to review because I love budget stuff and I certainly love budget phones. So stay tuned for that. And their high-end phone is called the uh, Nokia Pure View. It's got five cameras on the back, so you can do depth photos and adjust the focus after the fact. It's got a Snapdragon 845 processor. Uh, this one sells for $679 and only works on AT&T and T-Mobile here in the U.S. But if you wanted something with a bunch of cameras, uh, you can certainly get one there. But a bulk of the phones that they were displaying were in that more budget-like category. Now, of course, Nokia was best known for their iconic candy bar phones, and they've got one uh, selling right now for $45 here in the U.S. Uh, this one is called the 3310. It only works on 3G networks. It looks like it's AT&T and T-Mobile as well. Uh, and if you like that old design and don't need a smartphone, uh, you've got the flip phone alternative with the candy bar design that Nokia is quite well known for. Now for the kids, Lego was there with their Star Wars Boost Droid Commander set. It's $199. It includes R2-D2, the Gonk robot, and the mouse droid. And what you can do with these is program them to run around your house. You can use some coding applications that work with the Lego Boost sets that have been out previously. And you can do some really cool stuff with these Star Wars themed robots that you build from scratch yourself. Lots of fun. I may pick up some to play with my kids if I can ever get them into Star Wars. So those were kind of neat. Uh, you only get one of the boost modules though with the kit. So you can only control one robot at a time unless you buy more of those boost modules to get added functionality to the others. So there might be some added cost to get simultaneous performance here, but still I thought it was kind of cool. Another thing that might be of interest to uh, parents with kids or maybe just young at heart folks is the uh, Piper computer kit. Now we saw this at Toy Fair a year or two ago, but they have a new and improved version that has a larger screen. Uh, what it consists of is this uh, wooden box looking thing with the screen and it incorporates a Raspberry Pi and the kids have to put the entire thing together. They've got to do all the connections between the Pi and the display and then you can build out these little circuits with uh, breadboard projects for other types of functionality like buttons that you can push and a whole bunch of other projects. It's really cool because the kid has to build it themselves to get started and then build more things to learn about coding and the interaction between hardware and software. It's a great set, $299, which I think is pretty reasonable if you're looking to get uh, something for a kid that's really into coding and you want to keep them off your computer, so that's a safe thing to go with. And they also rolled out a new thing called the Command Center, which is a game controller that kids have to put together themselves and it incorporates an Arduino inside. I got one, they actually gave me one at the show to take a look at, so we're going to unbox this and review it on the Extras channel, but I'll give you a sneak preview of what it looks like here. So you can see it's a kit that you've got to assemble from scratch here. All the different parts are uh, just strewn about and you've got to figure out how to put it all together. They do have a, a nice big poster that shows you how to assemble everything and you've got the uh, analog stick here along with your buttons and everything and I'm really eager to do this. So I think what I'm going to do with this kit is probably do a live stream where you can all laugh at my uh, hardware prowess or lack thereof and then we'll cut up that live stream and do a little video with it because I think it might be fun to do this project from start to finish and see how it works. And this works with the uh, PC, the Mac and Linux devices and it uses again an Arduino so you could probably do some other stuff with it too. So stay tuned for that. Uh, the command center here costs $49, and I think you can get it directly from Piper. Now, if you've ever flown a drone before, you know that most of them are controlled with these two stick interfaces, which don't take too long to get used to, but they are not as intuitive perhaps as just having a single flight stick might be. And that is where Fluidity's FT Aviator comes in. Uh, this was designed by NASA astronaut Scott Parazinski, who heads up the company. He flew on five space shuttle flights. And this is a single stick controller for DJI drones. If you want to yaw the aircraft, you just twist the controller, pushing it forward moves the drone forward, back goes back, left and right perform as you would expect them to. And then you can also uh, lower and increase the altitude using a trigger and thumb control that's on the controller. And it works really nicely. I was very surprised by how natural it felt, uh, especially as compared to the standard two stick. And if you ever try this thing, I think you may have a hard time going back to the old interface. 
Now this only works with DJI drones, and what it does is it connects up with your smartphone via Bluetooth. Uh, they basically have their own interface to the DJI drone that replicates most of the features. And then the phone, of course, will communicate with your existing controller to communicate back with the drone. So it's kind of a, a middleman here for your controller, and that is how they make it all work. It looks like it's a pretty cool product, and I think it has a neat future ahead of it. It's $299 right now to start, and then they're going to raise the price to $449 after the pre-order period ends. And I think for people that are really competitive drone flyers or people that are looking to get uh, certain types of controls that they really can't get too well with the dual stick configuration might want to give this a shot and you can find it on their website. So let's move on now to some storage devices. WD and SanDisk were there. Uh, they are now shipping a one terabyte micro SD card for $449. So if you need to record a lot of drone footage, you can put that $450 card up in your drone and hope it all comes back. But it's just amazing you can get that much space on such a tiny little thing. It just boggles my 1980s mind to know that this is possible in the future that we live in now. So that was pretty cool to see. Now Synology was there and they've got a new NAS device called the DS419 Slim. This is a little mini NAS with four bays. It's suited for solid state drives. It's running an ARM chip, so it's probably not going to do well for Plex serving, but it will do video transcoding for its own uh, video application. So just bear that in mind. And this is designed to be very low powered, 20 watts maximum, seven watts at idle. It is not fanless though, so we'll have a fan that runs, but it's small enough that you could put it in places perhaps where you wouldn't normally have a larger NAS. It's got a Kensington lock on it as well, so you can lock it down. Discless, it is $329 and will have most of the features that you might find on other ARM-based Synology drives. They're gonna send one in for us to review, so I'll be taking a look at it. It only though has gigabit ethernet on the back. It does have two ethernet ports. Uh, but it doesn't have 10 gig support, which of course would be a real benefit if you're running with SSDs, but you should still be able to gain some of the random access benefits of those solid state drives. Now, if you've been wondering when the world might get a smart trash can, that time is now. Town New had their smart trash can on display. Uh, what it will do, first of all, is open up its lid automatically for you with a wave of the hand. And then when its bag gets full, it will automatically seal it up for you, no twist ties required. And then when you take that full bag out, it will replace it with a new bag, all without having to touch a thing. And if you are you know, one of those people that doesn't like to touch your trash can, this might be a nice little thing for you. Uh, it's not very large, so I don't think it's well suited for a kitchen trash can, probably more of a bathroom office kind of thing, but I thought it was kind of a neat concept. It actually seals the bag with heat uh, so it really is sealed up pretty tight when you are ready to pull that bag out. Now the trash can itself will run from about $110 to $120. They haven't yet settled on the final price yet. And then you have to get these special replacement uh, cartridges that contain the bags themselves. They said they're going to sell those for about 5 or $6 a piece and you'll get about 25 bags per replacement kit. And you have to recycle the plastic frame that uh, that kit consists of. So it's a little bit of overkill, I think, to a degree. I think they may have done better if they had made a smart diaper pail with that same design, but it's kind of a neat novelty and perhaps might be a fun gift to give at the holiday season. It is uh, rechargeable. I think it'll last about a month on a charge, or you can just plug it in because we have to plug everything in these days. Why not the trash can? So any event, that was the most uh, visited table, believe it or not, at Pepcom, the TV media love this stuff because it's so visual and unique and kind of fits into one of those standard lifestyle kind of stories. So there you go, it's always the shiny objects that get the most attention. So in any event, I hope you enjoyed this dispatch from Pepcom. Let me know what you thought down in the comments below and if there's anything in particular that I saw that you would really like to see in an upcoming review. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman and thank you for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters including Gold Level supporters, The Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht, Brian Parker, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month.
Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.